apologise in advance for being somewhat news angry and reading off the paper. I uh, found it a useful habit to stop me from meandering, so, so keep it in your time. So, uh, part of my work on better understanding the use of late medieval edged weapons has involved examining visual sources for figures engaged in combat. Through amassing as large a data set as possible, I hope to be able to spot trends in the way in which combat was depicted, and then see how they compared with the realities of combat for examining original weapons and fencing treatises. This is very much a work in progress, and far more data is needed before any solid conclusions can be made. However, some initial patterns are starting to emerge already. Uh, it is these that I will discuss today. Thus far, 482 visual sources oh, sorry for this person, uh, have been gathered, many of which contain multiple depictions of combatants, from which uh, 1,213 individual figures have been documented. Manuscript miniatures form by far the largest portion of these sources, while paintings, drawings, prints, murals, altarpieces, as well as tapestries and sculptures have also proved valuable sources of combat materials. <coughs> combat scenes have also been found in stained glass windows uh, and on decorated tools or household items to a lesser extent. A degree of caution must be taken when approaching late medieval artwork for insight into something as detailed as body mechanics, especially when working with martial arts, in which only a small portion of the population would likely have had an informed understanding. There seems to have been little consistency as to whether or not a given work made an attempt at realism. As most artwork was commissioned, the wishes of the patron, for which realism may not always have been a concern, would dictate the piece. When not so bound, however, the artist's own desires could give cause to deviate from realism. The piece could be intended to act more as a narrative or representative portrayal, or the artist could have felt obliged to follow certain aesthetic conventions. Real combat being often a disorganized affair, it may sometimes have been too disorganized to be accurately portrayed within the dictates of art at the time. This does not imply that there was a total lack of realism in artistic, in artistic depiction of combat. Many depictions of late medieval soldiers seem to be derived from accurate observations, or at least from accurate secondhand reports. Some artists were known to have either observed battles, interviewed participants, or even participated themselves. It's noteworthy while, that while Antonio Pisanello, painter of the tournament battle of Lubrizet, Fresco, at the Palazzo di Pale in Mantua, fought against the Venetians in 1439, Paolo Uccello, responsible for the Battle of San Romano, part of which is now held by the National Gallery in London, had never taken part in combat. Yet, both are equally meticulous in their portrayal of the combatants. Lastly, a selection of fencing treatises had been surveyed to see what their depictions of tech, uh, see where their depictions of techniques match those found in visual sources. While this is by no means an exhaustive list of works, they are an attempt at the very least to represent each of the major lineages or traditions that appear most commonly throughout the corpus of late medieval fencing literature. The sword is the most commonly depicted weapon, with falchions or messers. Uh, at a very distant second place, followed by daggers. Staff weapons, comprising poleaxes, blades, and halberds, were the least commonly depicted in use. No depictions of the bill being <coughs> used, either in readiness or attacking, uh, have been found. Uh, I should specify, um, if I see a weapon simply being held, whether it's on the march, uh, this is particularly common for staff weapons, I don't uh, document it. I'm only documented if it's being actively wielded in Depictions of combat on foot slightly outnumber those on horseback. However, this majority is not reflected throughout the individual weapon categories. Mounted combat holds a slight majority with swords. However, foot combat is most commonly depicted with falchion, dagger, or staff weapons. The overwhelming number of depictions so figures in ready positions. The exception to this rule lies with halberds and glaives. <coughs> Glaive is fairly balanced, eight attacks versus six ready positions. However, six out of the seven portrayals of the halberd show the wielder attacking. Figures seem more likely to be depicted in armor than not. Contrast is most pronounced among sword wielders. However, the, distance, the difference is less marked amongst those using falchions and daggers. All those wielding staff weapons are depicted in armor. Uh, although armored individuals are commonly found fighting both on foot and mounted, <coughs> There are far fewer unarmored individuals depicted fighting on horseback. Regarding additional defensive equipment, 
The shield is the most common one depicted. Over half of all mounted swordsmen are portrayed with one, compared to only 73 on foot. Only about one-ninth of the falcon wielders are shown uh, on foot are shown with shields, compared to about a quarter of those mounted. Only three dagger users on foot are portrayed with shields, and only two mounted dagger users. Far less represented was, was the buckler, the majority of which were depicted with combatants on foot. Going into trends by individual weapons group, some categories contain only a small number of depictions, uh, often too few from which to draw any initial conclusions. In the interest of time, only those with sufficient numbers of depictions will be discussed here in greater detail. As staff weapons on the whole are underrepresented in the current data set, I shall only discuss swords, falcons, and daggers further. Five ready positions with the sword of the foot are used <coughs> most often. The most common is the sword held over the right shoulder with the blade extending back. The next most popular is roughly the same position, except that the sword is held directly over the head. Following this is the blade still held over the head, but facing forward. Next, the blade held back again over the right shoulder, however, rather than extending straight backwards, it crosses from the right to left side, remaining close to the back. <coughs> the last shows the sword being held back over the head with two hands. Four of these are also commonly found in the fencing treatises, including the Munich copy of Karl Hopper's work, uh, the aforementioned 133, the Getty copy of Fiore de Libri's Fior Battaglia, and the, uh, what is referred to as the Clooney text. For attacks, the most common is a thrust to the chest. However, its majority is not by a large amount. Next down, equally represented, a thrust to the right armpit and to the abdomen. Two cuts form the remaining majority attack. Straight down cut to the head, and the same executed with two hands. All of these attacks are commonly found uh, in such treatises as 133, the Getty Fiore, the Clooney textbook, <coughs> and the Munich Talmopper as well. The mounted ready position, most commonly portrayed, the sword held back over the right shoulder, is over twice as numerous as the second most popular, the blade forward over the right shoulder. The sword held forward over the head ranks a close third, and the blade held back over the right shoulder across the back, fourth most common. Finally, the fifth most depicted is the sword held low, around hip level, with the blade angled upward. These positions can also be found in the Copenhagen, Munich, and Ambrasser copies of Talhofer, the Getty Fiore, and the manual known as the Blum des Kampf. As mounted attacks, cuts appear far more frequently than thrusts. The most commonly shown attack is, unusually, a two-handed cut straight down to the head. Slightly behind it is a cut to the left shoulder from high and right. And a single-handed cut straight down to the head is the next most common followed lastly by a cut to the left side of the head from high and right. Only one of these positions matches uh, any found in the fencing treatises, in this case, the Getty Fiore. The most commonly depicted ready position with falchion on foot shows the weapon held back over the right shoulder. This can also be found in the Munich Talhofer. The next most popular position is the blade held forward over the head, which is found in Paulus Kahl's Munich treatise. Following these is the blade facing back from the same side. <coughs> Fourth is the blade held back over the head in two hands, followed by the blade held over the right shoulder across the back. Two of these match the techniques, uh, match techniques found in the fencing treatises, uh, as I had mentioned. No thrusts with the falcon <coughs> have been yet been documented in the visual sources, uh, as we differentiate here from the fencing treatises, <coughs> and none of the cuts <coughs> from the visual sources match any found in the, thir in the fencing treatises surveyed thus far. Of mounted ready positions with the falcon, the most often depicted is the blade back over the right shoulder. The next most common is the blade held <coughs> over the head, followed by two equally depicted positions, held back over the left shoulder and <coughs> back over the head. There are no attacks recorded with the falchion from horseback, and no use of the falchion while, while mounted uh, has appeared in any of the surveyed fencing treatises. 
three ready positions with the dagger on foot stand out amongst the others. The vast majority are shown with the dagger in a reverse grip, the blade held over the right shoulder. This position is one of the most commonly found in the dagger section of the Munich Talhofer and the Getty Fiore as well. The second and third positions are each recorded with equal frequency. One is the dagger still in a reverse grip, held back over the right shoulder. The other shows the dagger in a reverse grip in the left hand, held forward over the left shoulder. This position is the only left-handed position recorded for daggers, and the likelihood of this being more out of visual necessity than being an accurate depiction is, uh, cannot be ruled out. No ready positions involving two hands have yet been found. Only two attacks with the dagger on foot stand out amongst the others, turning up more than once or twice. An overhand thrust to the chest from above, and an overhand thrust from high to the face, both with the dagger in a reverse grip. Both of these attacks can also be found in the Getty Fiore and in the Munich Talhofer. Only one mounted ready position with the dagger is shown multiple times, the dagger being held in a reverse grip forward over the right shoulder. Likewise, only one type of dagger attack is depicted more than once. This shows the dagger uh, held in a reverse grip and executing an overhead thrust downward to the face. No instances of mounted dagger use are found in any of the surveyed fencing treatises. Certain initial patterns have begun to emerge. For swords, falchions, and daggers, both on foot and mounted, the same five ready positions are most commonly depicted. Held back over the uh, right shoulder, held back or forward over the head, <coughs> held back over the right shoulder across the back, and two-handed over the head. Many of these are perhaps intuitive positions, which even untrained individuals might find themselves in given such a weapon. Whilst these depictions could be the artists using their imaginations based on what seems right, they could also be the result of observation of those positions that were most commonly adopted. Across all the weapons, the most common target areas for attack seem to be cut straight down to the head, thrusts to the head, cuts to the shoulders and sides of the head, and finally thrusts to the face. The majority of attacks with sword on foot seem to be thrusts, while cuts are dominant when the attacker is mounted. Cuts also dominate with the falchion, which is perhaps unsurprising given the design of the weapon. The head and shoulders seem to be the most common targets, both straight down and from an angle. The face and chest were the most common targets for thrusts with the dagger. The most common ready positions in the visual sources are well represented in the treatises, often being some of the most commonly depicted there as well. The same can generally be said for cuts and thrusts. Far less matched between the treatises and the visual sources, however, are cuts and thrusts from horseback. Mounted ready positions, by, con by contrast, are fairly well matched. However, there are by far uh, more depictions of these in visual sources than in the treatises. While this disparity should be noted, one should not read too much into it. For while each visual source was created to suit the artist's particular needs or desires, which could involve the portrayal of masses of heavy cavalry, for example, far fewer images are necessary for the masters to teach and display a particular technique. Few ready positions, and no attacks at all, with the falchion from the visual sources are matched in the treatises. It is also noteworthy that nowhere in the treatises is there any coverage of the falchion from horseback. On one hand, Falcons are comparatively underrepresented in the fencing treatises as well, so there is less content from which to find potential matches. However, there are two other possibilities to account for the presence of falcons in the visual sources in ways that are not found in the treatises. One is that artists, either unaware or indifferent to the particulars of the weapon, simply chose to depict them in the same positions that they would a sword. Furthermore, given that scenes in which falcon wielders are found in many of the visual sources it is also possible that the artist used that weapon to represent either a weapon from antiquity or to represent a weapon being wielded by a non-Christian. Further investigation of the particular scenes in which these appear is necessary, however, before any follow conclusions can be formed. Daggers are also poorly matched between the visual sources and the treatises. However, although there are a few matches in ready positions or thrusts with the daggers, those that do match are amongst the most commonly depicted in both uh, genres. Time constraints prevent me from going into some of the other areas of inquiry that I'm currently pursuing, such as paying particular attention to footwork and body position in addition to weapon position. However, even these points alone offer some interesting insights into the way in which they were depicted, and if the correlations with the treatises are any indication, how they may have been commonly used. 
There's much work to be done and many more questions to be posed, however, before a deeper understanding into these lost arts are really going to adapt. Thank you.